thank you for coming. Um, so this meeting is about um, active matter in complex environment. Um, and the first talks that are given to me will be only on a single active article. So we want to kind of set up the stage because before you go to active matter. So yeah, before you go to active matter, let's learn something about the constituents, namely a single active article. So let me use this. Um, and, but before I really start, I want to um, tell you something about me, because most of you don't know me. So I have a history on um, cellular crowding and porous media. So that is indeed a complex environment. I will come back to that in the third lecture. So you, here you have a material that consists of um, frozen, uh, a frozen structure that is immobile in time. And it's close to what's called the percolation transition that is it's almost, um, it's almost, oh, sorry, it still um, uh, connects all space. So for example, this red particle here can make it through the entire structure, although it has to meander through some kind of labyrinth structure. And we uh, published many works on that in, in the last um, already 15 years. And the second topic I'm known for is the glass transition. So that's actually where I did my PhD on and my, um, so that was on the mode coupling theory of the glass transition. And my supervisor told me after finishing my PhD, I should do something else. So I found my own topic. But some 10 years later, 15 years later, I decided, OK, maybe not so much has been going on in that field. So we uh, derived an, uh, also a mode coupling theory, this time for this confinement geometry. But I'm also active on needles and biofilaments. I will also come back that in the third topic. So this is also a kind of crowded environment where you have filaments that are kind of um, uh, uh, give rise to an entangled dynamics. Um, I did uh, help analyze experiments on intracellular transport. And last but not least, I'm interested in driven transport that is truly non-equilibrium systems uh, with exact solutions. So um, before we start with active particles, let's recall the history of Brownian motion. So I guess you are all familiar with this. So this is basically just a warm up. So Robert Brown observed, um, observed uh, pollen in water. So what he saw was something like that in the, oops, something like that in, in the movie. This is from Wikipedia. So he used um, a single lens microscope and I was, so before, in, age, in previous talks, I just showed some ancient microscope, and, but then I learned, no, it was a single lens like microscope, so it consists only of a lens. And since I'm not an experimentalist, I don't really know what's the difference between a single lens like microscope and a magnifying glass. But anyway, yeah, so that's what he did. Um, so he saw this agitated, erratic, never-ending motion of this pollen in, in water. And um, he correctly concluded, so, so he um, could withstand this tempting conclusion that this has something to do with life. So he, in, in essence, so in modern terms, he would conclude, no, this has to be some intrinsic property of these mesosized particles. So they are on the size of some micrometers and uh, the solvent. Yeah? Um, there, there's an interesting hint history, of course. So every time you have a great discovery, you're wondering, is this really the first person who made this discovery? So is this the one uh, after which his name is the, truly the inventor or the first who observed it? So there are earlier exper experiments by Jan Ingenhus, um, who observed the motion of coal dust on a, a liquid surface. And uh, I used to tell the story, so maybe, maybe Ingenhus um, first observed Brownian motion. And it turns out that the page on Wikipedia actually changed since I first made the talk. And they said, no, Ingenhus did not observe brown motion because his particles were way too big. This was just convection. Yeah? And uh, actually, Ingenhus made an, a big point of this and said, OK, you have to be careful if you do microscopy. So you better use a cover slip. Otherwise, you get these convective flows. Uh, that will perturb your, your images. So the invention of this cover slip, this is important to suppress the convection, not the Brownian motion. Yeah? And if you even, even go back in time, there's a poem by the, uh, by the Roman poet Lucretius, De Rerum Natura, where he um, ex essentially describes the dancing of smoke particles in air. 
um, which is again not really Brownian motion because um, this is again turbulence is due to the turbulent motion of the air in, the, in uh, close to a fire. But his conclusions were essentially correct. So he attributed this erratic motion of these smoke particles to even smaller particles that would kick the smoke particles. Yeah? So this idea of atomism was, in, was already present and was um, used in, in this poem here by Lucretius. Okay, now, Now here you can see it again. Um, so the theoretical breakthrough came with Einstein who used this um, so-called molecular kinetic interpretation. And the idea is that the motion, this erratic motion is attributed to collisions with the molecules of the solvent. And what you can observe is just the motion of the uh, um, mesosized particles. And you see only the increments due to many, many, many collisions. And in terms of, um, 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 a modern language that we would call, uh, we would attribute this to the central limit theorem. Say, if every time you make a collision, you get a small increment. And say, on coarse grain time scales, these collisions are independent, which they are not, but sufficiently enough. Then you say, okay, you add just independent increments, which are random. Then the central limit theorem tells you that uh, the probability distribution for um, an increment r, which is r called r here, in lag time t, this is just a Gaussian. What is to be known about a Gaussian? Well, it's only the mean, and here the system is isotropic, so the mean has to vanish, so forget about gravity here. And the only thing that remains to be known is the variance, which is in this case the mean square displacement. Yeah? So the mean square displacement characterizes the Gaussian completely. And if you go back to our argument of the central limit theorem, they said, okay, the variance should grow with the number of collisions, right? So with the number of um, uh, number of ear collision events. But this clearly grows linearly in time. So the mean square displacement should in uh, increase linearly in time. And the only thing then uh, that enters is a material parameter, which is the diffusion coefficient. And this uh, number six here is just due to three dimensions. So in one dimension, it would be two. And um, Einstein was not the first to observe that this, um, uh, prop, uh, this prop, I call this the propagator, solves also the diffusion equation. And you see here this nice animation where this uh, uh, Gaussian broadens with time. Yeah? So the new thing is, of course, this diffusion equation was known um, before. But rather than uh, talking about concentration, he, uh, he attributed this to a probability density. So he gave a statistical interpretation of um, diffusion. And again, you wonder, is Einstein really first um, to think about that? So it turns out that at the same time, Marian Smolochowski, who was a, a knight in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, um, had very similar ideas to Einstein uh, at the same time but he did not dare to publish his work. Why not? Because he didn't have an experiment to prove his ideas. So you see Einstein was not that modest, so Einstein published without experiment, and only then Smolochowski decided, okay, I can do the same thing and just publish my work. Okay. Um, there's, an, there's another tool that was developed on the, um, on the a few years later, this is so-called Langevin description. It brings us to stochastic differential equations, and we will use this in the in the following lectures. So, what Langevin did is essentially he wrote down a force ballot. So, on the left hand, you have the acceleration force. Then you have uh, a deterministic friction force. So, this is just a friction force that a particle experiences if you drag it with constant velocity through the medium. So this is Stokes drag with theta, the friction coefficient is six t, eta is the viscosity, and a is the radius of the particle, spheric particle. And uh, all that he did is he added now this random force. Yeah? So he didn't know really a lot about the random force. So I mean, it's just a force balance. So you say, okay, there's a deterministic part that we know from the macroscopic world and something that exceeded that is random. And all he knew about it was that it has to vanish on average to recover the macroscopic motion. And the real 
formalism as we know it today is um, actually formulated by Einstein. So he really characterized the, um, the uh, noise, so this random force. So he postulated that this noise should be delta correlated, which is amazing because he did this something like, I think, 1918, and the delta function was invented only in the late 1920s. Yeah, so he postulated this form um, the, uh, without knowing about the delta function. He said, okay, there's, he, I think he called this phi, and said there's some function, and all that matters of this function is that the area under this function is normalized to one. Yeah? So it's, very, it's a very compressed function uh, with a fixed area, and this is the essence, actually, of a delta function. Okay. Um, Nowadays we call this so. Nowadays we call this white noise. Why is this so? So the reason is what you can do is you can um, decompose this. Um, you can decompose this force into Fourier components in a finite observation time, and then take essentially the, uh, the, the magnitude squared per per the observation time. This is kind of the power. So as a radio engineer, you would call this the power, and actually, indeed they call this the power spectral density. And by the wiener kinchin theorem, this is just a Fourier transform of this. So this turns to be uh, uh, turns out to be frequency independent. That's why it's called white noise. And again, all these terms that we're using today were invented only much later. I think in the 1940s, and I guess this was due to the Second World War and radio technology when people were thinking about really radio power and so on. So think of it now. It all seems so natural to us, but in the time it was invented, this was all completely new. Uh -huh. So um, um, if you look at this uh, stochastic differential equation, you see immediately you can read off a characteristic time scale, the so mass of a friction coefficient, which I call the naive momentum relaxation time. And after long times, you can basically, uh, you can ignore uh, the inertial term and our differential equation reduces to a force balance where the friction uh, forces is just compensated by the random forces. And I will show a little bit more at a, at a later stage, uh, take this here for the introduction. Then you can easily integrate this for the displacement. So this is a displacement in one dimension. And you can just square and take an average and using the, uh, the outer correlation function of the force, you see that this grows again linearly in time, just as we anticipated by Einstein. What is the new ingredient that we find here? So here was supposed to be the diffusion coefficient. So we get uh, a new relation, which is, uh, goes back to Einstein. So he says the diffusion coefficient where, uh, is connected to the friction coefficient, and the player in between is kBT. So think about this, this equation here in the following way. On the left-hand side, the diffusion coefficient measures the measures the fluctuations in the system. So this is the spread of the probability cloud, something that goes really randomly, but uh, according to some probabilistic law. On the right-hand side, this friction coefficient is from the macroscopic world. This is the macroscopic world of the deterministic response. And the KBT connects the world of the macroscopic deterministic response to the microscopic world of the fluctuations. ABT is the player here. And if you think about this relation, this, um, this is very similar to a, a, another relation where Einstein was involved, namely, um, he, said he connected the world of mechanics to the world of waves. Yeah? So the world of mechanics, energy, would be connected to frequency by h bar. Yeah? So, so it's, I think it's not a coincidence that Einstein um, was involved in both of these great Recoveries. So this relation here, KBT, fluctuations, macroscopic response, this is one, uh, basic, uh, one basic insight, and that's, I think that's one reason why everybody of you um, has to learn statistical physics. Okay. Um, the first experimental observation came not much later with Jean-Baptiste Perrin uh, um, uh, and his students who recorded really uh, recorded really individual trajectories of these particles. And um, yeah, you may think, okay, uh, and he got the, uh, the Nobel Prize awarded for that um, because it proved the physical reality of molecules and it allowed for an independent measurement of the Avogadro constant. Yeah, so the Avogadro constant was known before, but this was kind of a completely complementary method 
to show, demonstrate really the physical reality of models. And you, you may wonder, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't remember the details now. Yeah, I have it in some of my lecture notes, but I don't remember the details. Okay. Yeah, but yes. Um, anyway, that's not that's not so important. So what's interesting about that story here again is, um, it's like, yeah. So you get a Nobel Prize for doing the experiment of Brown again, right? It's like, no, it's like no, um, because there was a, there was one there were there were several new things that were going on. So. The, one is um, this, uh, his measurements became, became only shorter after the invention of dark field microscopy, so which allowed him to make much better measurements. And second, if you want to do a statistical analysis, you want that your particles are all the same, yeah, or more or less the same. And what uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrin was known for is he was the master of the ultra centrifuge. Yeah, so he could produce we call now monodisperse um, samples. Yeah? So these particles were more or less all of the same size, and this is important. So you see every time, as a theorist, you say, okay, just do an experiment, which has been done almost 100 years before, and then you get a Nobel Prize, and it's like, no, there was some really technolo technological advance that uh, allowed him to make really quantitative measurements, and that was the whole point. Okay. Um, this doesn't really belong to this talk. So um, um, the experiments by Perrin um, nowadays can be they have made with optical trapping. Maybe Juliane will tell, tell about that, um, where you get, uh, so basically you focus a laser beam, and there you get temporal resolution to sub-microseconds, uh, um, sub-nanometer spatial resolution. You get down to trapping forces which are right in the interesting range, range where, um, biologi so where um, biological forces actually act. So this is really now um, an ultra-sensitive bio biophysical tool uh, where you can um, monitor local properties of, uh, of um, your, um, your samples. So that's just a side of reminder. Okay. Um, um, but this harmonic trapping is also a nice example to learn a little bit more about our stochastic differential equation. So um, we have now here, to a good approximation, a harmonic restoring force. So the force is proportional to the uh, displacement. This is the spring constant. I uh, ignore, again, the ma mass because we are in the overdamped limits. The friction dominates. And then the force balance looks the following way. So here's the friction force. Here we have the optical trapping. And here the random force. And again, you read off by dimensional analysis uh, uh, a characteristic time scale, which is the trapped relaxation time. You make an assumption here on this, uh, on this force. You can easily calculate what I call the positional autocorrelation function, which is just a relaxing exponential. Relaxes on this time scale of this trapped relaxation time. If you look at the power spectral density, which is the Fourier transform by the Wiener Kinchin theorem, you get this Lorentzian shape. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, but in the force balance equation, how did that uh, acceleration term like? Okay. Um, so, so that's a good that's a good point, and that's a long story on many accounts. So, basically, what I'm telling you is is wrong. Yeah. So it's wrong. So, so okay, of course, uh, so in principle, I should add the mass, uh, I should add the mass term, like in this one here. Uh, where was it? I should add the mass term here. But then you, you figure out that at long times, the mass doesn't play any role. Basically, there's, a, this, this, um, there's this time scale, like this, there's this time scale, this momentum relaxation time, and after this time scale, basically the momenta are that they are equilibrated and they don't contribute anymore to the force balance. That's the argument that you are generally presented. It turns out this is not true, and that's a long story. Um, it's not true because so the, the flaw is in this formula here. So the flaw is that you are using Stokes friction, and you say the force that you experience is just proportional to your current velocity. This is not true because this formula is made for the steady motion of the particle. So if you dra drag a particle with constant velocity, 
This is not what our particle does. Our particle is yeah? So this is completely different. So what you need to do is you have to account for um, the entire history, and this is called hydrodynamic memory. You can make this experiment yourself in the bathtub. So you start rocking in the bathtub, and then you stop. And according to this formula, then the friction should stop. But it doesn't, because the water still has kinetic energy, and the water still keeps. So what happens is um, there is hydrodynamic memory, so, you, um, so your force depends also on the entire past. And this is not a fast process, but dies only with, um, uh, with the power law and gives rise to that this formula is actually not correct. So it's not a white noise, but it's a colored noise, um, which, you can, which has been measured some 10 years ago, um, even in the range of microseconds. But usually, usually we forget about all these effects and assume that so if you don't measure with very, very high precision, you won't know about any of these effects. But in principle, you're right. There are inertial terms. It's not really the mass of the particle that plays a role, but it's the mass of the fluid that somehow spoils the picture. But it's an interesting and long story, but not today. Okay. Good. Um, I see I'm way too slow. So let's come to self-propelled um, agents. And the experimental introduction, I think, will be given by Juliane. So I keep it short here. So there are different, um, uh, there are many biological organisms that use different strategies to self-propel. So these bacteria, for example, they use um, flagella that has, uh, shake and uh, or rotate to, to propel the particle. Then there are these um, paramecium, for example, these um, uh, eukaryote cells uh, that have these cilia that um, start shaking and more, maybe from, from a technological point of view, more interesting this, this artificial particles, these Janus particles, as they are called, they have been named after the Roman god that has two faces. So these particles have two, two different faces. One side is coated that can catalyze some chemical reaction. And um, if your fuel, uh, if your uh, solvent contains some kind of fuel, then a chemical reaction can be induced such that the particle starts uh, moving in one direction. Huh? And there has been, so this, these systems are intrinsically out of equilibrium. They're far from equilibrium. And that makes them interesting for physics for the 21st century. There has been lots of experimental progress to build these artificial particles and to study them and monitor them really under the microscope. Um, most people are interested in collective phenomena, like this, um, this active matter, which is this school about. Um, there are, I may, will mention only some um, phenomena, flocking, swarms, phase separation, and trapping. And, but most are actually simulational studies, and there are not so many experiments. And what was kind of lacking when I entered this field was a complete characterization of even a single particle. And so we try to this uh, pushes this a little bit further in this presentation. OK, here, here are some more slides on these biological microswimmers, um, self-propulsion by these flagella, so coli, spermatozoa, um, some algae, and these eukaryotic cells. Then there are artificial agents. We already had these Janus particles, but there are also some, uh, some uh, magnetic particles that can be agitated by external magnetic field, fields to make them swim. Um, the collective phenomena are striking, so I just um, show you three movies that I took from the literature. So one is um, on what they call is bacterial turbulence. So these are bacteria, and if you just monitor them, yes, you see uh, lots of structures. You see kind of vortices. You see um, uh, you, you see patterns that are reminiscent of turbulence. Of course, the microscopic mechanism is very different from perturbulism uh, turbulence. And if you look into in detail, it has nothing to do with turbulence, but the name is really attractive. Yeah. Second experiment, this is the one I like most. This is the Feynman ratchet that you have all read in your, maybe in statistical physics. So if you do this experiment, you have a ratchet, um, and you do this in a gas, then you, uh, the naive argument would tell you that the molecules um, hit this ratchet, and this ratchet starts rotating in one direction, and you get energy, or you can uh, extract work for free. 
And of course, this doesn't work. And Feynman argues why this doesn't work, because there are fluctuations. And this wheel will start rotating also in the wrong direction. And at the end, you cannot extract any work. There's no network that you can extract. There's no net motion. This is rather different, different if you use bacteria. And these bacteria, they kind of run into, um, into these um, corners here. They get stuck, and they try to push the, the rest. So in principle, this is really a way to extract work from bacteria. This is a vision for the future. Um, last experiment that I want to show you is this case separation. So these are particles where you can switch on and off the, um, the motility by external light. And yeah, so it was already switched on. So if the light is switched on, you see these particles start to aggregate in clusters. This is called then motility-induced phase separation. Um, once the light is switched off again, this is happening here. You see that these clusters dissolve, and um, and the phase separation is um, uh, does not happen anymore. So this is very nice, and has fascinated basically people for the last um, 15 years. Now let's go into theory, and I start up start with a warm up, with a model that you can easily solve that you can easily solve. Unfortunately, this model is totally unrealistic. It's a good toy model. You can use it for simulations, but you cannot compare it to experiments. So the idea is the following. So how can we include now this activity, the self-propulsion in our stochastic differential equations? So I write down the equation again. So this is, the, this is now the, um, uh, this is the velocity. Um, this is the, the noise term. This is, the, this is a force that may act on the particle or not. And mu is called the mobility. This is the inverse of the friction coefficient that we had before. Yeah? And the new term that appears here is uh, a colored noise. This is the idea to model the activity. So these, um, these two noise terms, eta and eta a, they are considered to be independent. This is they don't know anything about each other. And they have the following autocorrelation function. So this is the white noise term that we had earlier. So the strength is parametrized here in this uh, diffusion coefficient or passive diffusion coefficient. And this active term, this has now uh, is a colored noise. So this has an interesting time dependence. So the time dependence is here just in exponential in the lag time. Huh? So um, by pure dimensional analysis, you see here, OK, there enters this tau. This is now the correlation time of this active noise. And by pure dimensional analysis, this, um, there, there has to be dA over T. So dA has the dimension of a diffusion coefficient. And by, then you can uh, do the following. You can extract a characteristic length scale from the square root of the active diffusion coefficient and the correlation time. This will play a role later on. Um, of course, without this colored noise, this is just a passive particle, as we had before. So, um, so I can define a new parameter um, um, measuring the degree of activity of our system, of how far we are away from thermal equilibrium. This is called the Piclet number. There are different conventions here. I choose the convention. This is just parameter dA divided by the diffusion coefficient of the passive system. Yeah, I said this is the drift term to the forces, and the mobility is just the inverse friction coefficient. So this says forces are, in this overdamped case, translated directly into velocities, not into accelerations, because we are in the overdamped system. And this colored noise turns the whole process into a non-equilibrium process. Well, this is not entirely true. Um, so if, you, if, it, uh, if it's without this deterministic drift force, then it maps to a problem namely the, precisely the problem of Langevin before, um, that you could observe also in the equilibrium process. But yeah, so the idea of the colored noise is to make it non equilibrium Quick question. So you are calling it colored noise because the power spectrum is decaying differently than omega, 1 by omega squared. Is that no. Um, so, um, so that's a good point. So as I showed you before, so if you go to the frequency domain, if you take the Fourier transform of this one, this is frequency independent. Yeah? If you do the Fourier transform of this, you get a Lorentzian shape, so it decays like 1 over omega squared. Yeah? So this is not white noise, because high frequencies are suppressed, and that's why I call it colored. Yeah? But that's, that's a good point. OK. 
Now, um, let's look at the solution now for the free, um, uh, free Einstein, uh, active Einstein Unical, uh, Einstein Unbeck process. So there's no force, and I can now integrate again directly for the increment. So the increment is just the displacement starting from time zero, and I just integrate my stochastic differential equation. Uh, and by this, you see eta is a Gaussian variable, eta a is a Gaussian variable, they're all centers. So this displacement is a sum, and a sum of many independent Gaussian variables, a sum of Gaussian variables. So this is again a Gaussian variable and it's centered. So it's totally clear what the propagator looks like. Um, so all we need to know is then the mean square displacement, this is the displacement in x direction squared plus the one in y direction squared. And I use this equation here to calculate, say, the x displacement. So I just basically copy paste. I use that eta and eta a are independent. They don't know anything about each other. And I replace, I put in what I assumed for, for these noise terms, so this delta term and this um, exponential. And then you can easily do this double integral, uh, get the same calculation for y, and I add up to this formula here. And we see we obtain a mean square displacement that has this contribution from the passive diffusion that grows just linearly in time and something that shows some structure on the time scale tor, but in long term times, you can forget about this term, and it will be dominated by this one, and you get an effective diffusion, so a mean square displacement that grows linearly in time with an effective diffusion coefficient. Now, here are some images. Um, I should mention, actually, this where is the same formula or has the same structure as you would get if you uh, would solve the Langevin equation with mass. Yeah? So it says the same functional form. This tau would then correspond to the naive momentum relaxation term. So what does it look like? So here are some images. Um, so T is measured in this correlation time for a purely passive particle, that, or for an almost passive particle with a clean number close to zero, small one. You see this is almost linear. So this looks almost like passive diffusion. If I increase now this, uh, this driving, that is the activity, you see that a structure emerges that you get a term, you get, you get something that it, uh, it grows like um, t squared in between. This is just the driving. Yeah? So this is, this is now the, the driving um, um, due to the Pickley number. If you go even to Pickley number infinity, um, so there's this, okay, there's this short time diffusion, there's this long time diffusion, so it grows again linearly. In between, it is faster than linearly. And this hip happens precisely at the time scale of the correlation time or the length scale of this uh, characteristic length scale that we introduced before. So um, you see this t to the squared motion. I call this persistent motion. Some people call it ballistic motion. But ballistic is so reminiscent of, um, of a projectile and of mass. Here's no mass. Here's no mass. Here's no inertia, nothing. So I don't like this term ballistic. I call it Persistent, so it's, um, yeah, because it um, grows faster than linearly. So, I have okay. one more question. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Yeah, so uh, when Peclin number is infinity, essentially it would imply that advection is so much stronger than diffusion that it always dominates. Diffusion. Yeah, so basically you can forget the passive diffusion and you have only the active noise term. I see. So the active noise is driving the diffusion at long times and passive noise is driving diffusion yeah. at short times. I see. Yeah, okay. so, so the effective diffusion coefficient is the sum of both, but in the case of um, high Pickley number, you can forget about the passive contribution and the process is completely dominated by the active term. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, and I already told you that the functional form uh, that I showed you on the last slide is actually the same as if solving the Langevin equation that I showed you originally with the mass term. So it's not really a non-equilibrium process here. Okay. Now for the propagator, and with propagator I mean the following. So this is the probability that in lag time t you displace by r. So I, we had this earlier for the passive particles, and here I define it quite generally. So the delta r is the displacement, the, re, the real one that we observed at time t. And this delta function uh, basically makes a click every time um, you see such a, a displacement with the given um, increment r, and then you take the average. So that's the probability to find a displacement r in lag time t. 
this is easily calculated because we know it's Gaussian. We know that delta R is a random Gaussian variable uh, with, uh, that is centered. So all we need to know is the mean square displacement. So this is the general form for the Gaussian propagator. It's in 2D, so there's no factor 2 here. So this is in 2D, and the com uh, form is completely given. Uh, let me see if I can show you the animation again. So this is a two-dimensional Gaussian that just spreads in time. So the spreading in time is not proportional to time, but with this more complicated formula of the mean square displacement that I showed you earlier. In particular, since this is a Gaussian, um, higher cumulants vanish. So the mean square displacement is just a second cumulant, and all higher cumulants vanish. And uh, characterizations that, um, uh, uh, that parameterize deviations from a Gaussian are, for example, this non-Gaussian parameter which is something like the fourth moment divided by the second moment squared with some factors. And this quantity vanishes for a Gaussian propagator. And we will see that for real, part, uh, real uh, particles, this does not vanish, but there's some information in it because the propagator will not be Gaussian in general. Okay. Um, a nice way to, to look at the propagator is actually at the Fourier transform which is called the intermediate scattering function. So this is the Fourier transform of the propagator. And it's called intermediate scattering function because you can measure it in a scattering experiment. And I will show, show you later data, experimental data, um, how they compare to, uh, to different models. But here, is, so k is the scattering wave vector. Um, you can also read this function here as the characteristic function of the displacement. So you can generate all moments by taking derivatives uh, with this case here. Now, um, this looks like a typo, so it looks like f should depend on the vector k rather than just on its magnitude. But here I'm doing this only for isotropic systems, so I can average over all directions. So because of isotropy, it doesn't depend on the direction. And now I can use this formula and just average over all directions of k, and I arrive in, as an equivalent expression. So this J0 is just the Bessel function of order 0. And here you have k times the absolute magnitude of the displacement. This holds in 2D. If you make a small k expansion of this function, you see that the small k expansion encodes the mean square displacement and the mean quartic displacement and so on and so on. So it, this, um, as I said, this characteristic function encodes, generates the low order moments of the process. And what you're really doing is you're looking at the process at the scale of, or of the scale of 2 pi over k. That is the wavelength corresponding to this wave vector here. You're making a spatial temporal analysis. I come back later to this. But for this einstein ullenbeck particle, this is completely boring because we know that p is a Gaussian. And if you do a Fourier transform of a Gaussian, you end up with a Gaussian again, in k at least. Yeah? So this is in this Gaussian model. This is just k squared times the mean square displacement. And I try to draw a picture here for the intermediate scattering function. You see they all look rather boring. So they are just decaying from 1 to 0. So it starts with 1 because at time 0, there's no, no displacement. So it goes down to 0. Um, the time scale where it uh, goes to 0 depends on the, on the scale that you are looking at. So that's given by the wave number uh, k. Uh, and on small, say, if you're looking on small wave numbers, that is on large distances, then this quantity decays slowly. If you're looking at higher k, that is a small distances, it decays faster. But the functional form is rather boring. Uh, when you call it an intermediate scattering function, I mean, do you, like, why do you call it a scattering function? Is there any for potential in mind? There, um, uh, scattering from a potential? There something? is. So, uh, so I will come to back at this later when I show you real experiments. So you can, so in principle, what you can do is a light scattering experiment. Um, um, so dynamic light scattering. But there are smarter techniques that yield the same function. So this terminology comes from the realm of light scattering, neutron scattering, X-ray scattering. And with, yeah, OK, it's, um, so neutron scattering, would typically what you would do here is um, neutron spin echo methods, uh, methods that uh, act in real time, but in the Fourier, spatial Fourier domain. Yeah? So, so it's a directly measurable quantity 
Uh, whereas the propagator, of course, you can also measure it, but there, this you would do with video microscopy. This can be done with scattering methods, which uh, have a much higher throughput, so your statistics is much better than video microscopy. function is essentially the uh, dynamic equivalent of structural factors, right? Yeah, so, the, uh, yeah, so, um, so there is from solid state physics, you're familiar with the dynamic structure factor, but this would be, then uh, here you do another Fourier transform with respect to time. Yeah? Oh, yeah. So the dynamic structure factor would depend on the K and omega. Yeah? So um, it's true, uh, so that, that's what you usually measure in, um, uh, triple axis neutron spectroscopy, but if you want to go to, uh, to large times, you usually do it in the temporal domain. So we don't do the spatial Fourier transform with respect to time here. That's why it's called intermediate. Yeah? So you're doing only one Fourier transform, not both. Yeah? But you are right, this all comes from solid state physics. Yeah? So you see, that's my history of the glass formation. Okay, um, I tried to make animations of a random walker, that is the that is the, um, um, yeah, this, this is the Langevin equation for passive partic particle. And you see this kind of fractal structures. This motion here, of course, is in discrete time. That's why I call it a random walker. And this compares all to the story that you know of the drunken sailor that leaves a bar and does random steps in any direction. And in average, he doesn't get nowhere. Um, but his, um, on, uh, so the, the probability cloud just spreads in time. Let's do it with a point more between the period and time. Yeah, so there's no, so this is actually self similar. I try to make it that you don't see any structures uh, at the microscopic scale. If you now go to the active Einstein Uhlenbeck particle, then you see this is not so rough on, on microscopic scale. So on microscopic scale, it kind of looks more straight. So I have to tell this is at infinite Pickley number, so there's no passive diffusion, otherwise this would be just superimposed. So you see on small scale, this look, doesn't look as random, so it looks kind of directed, um, essentially on the length scale of the persistence length, this length scale L that we had. But on larger length scale, it looks rather similar to this one. So on larger length scale, it looks like diffusion, just as we anticipated from the Gaussian propagator or from the mean square distribution. Yeah? So this I tried to do to illustrate what is the difference between a random walker and the active Einstein movement. Now, let's come to... Um, ah, mm -hmm. I cannot really hear you. Sir, at first place, like, why did we find intermediate scattering function? Um, because you can measure it, because you can measure it, and it's a completely equivalent characterization to the propagator. Yeah? So, so, the, um, so we saw there's the mean square displacement, but the mean square, I will, I will try to bias you that the mean square displacement is a bad indicator because it's not very characteristic. So we already saw, or I tried to convince you that the formula this formula here is actually the same as the Langevin equation with a massive particle. So you don't really see any acti the activity here. And um, I will show you that the same functional form uh, also arises in different models. Um, and in order to distinguish the models, you have to look at spatial temporal information. This is either the propagator or the Fourier transform, this intermediate scattering function. Yeah? Okay. So we want to know more than the mean square displacement because the mean square displacement is a bad indicator. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Sir. Now, so now I come to the real model that I want to discuss. So everything before was just warm up. Yeah? And then see that I'm terrible in time. But anyway, since I, I can continue tomorrow, so I don't have to cover everything, I think it's important that we agree on the basics here. So let's look now at what is called the active Brownian particle. So the active Brownian particle is a particle that does the following. So it um, has a, pre a preferred axis, so I call this U of T. And uh, so that's a unit vector. 
this axis can rotate. So there is rotational diffusion of this axis and the particle can, um, oh, I should, forgot the main point is, I oh, know it goes with, uh, so it goes with constant velocity along that axis. Yeah? It goes with this axis, but this axis changes with time. So since this, there's rotational diffusion, and you may add, if you want to, translational diffusion, and it may even be unisotropic. That is, the diffusion coefficient perpendicular to this axis may be different from the one um, parallel to this axis. This is an effective model, so I don't even know how the propulsion is generated, if I'm using some fuel, if I illuminate this or, or whatever. So this is just uh, an effective model that um, gives some results. And I don't tell you what, uh, what are the numbers of these uh, parameters. These are just parameters entering the model. Um, by dimensional analysis, you again see that there's a, a, a certain time scale involved, namely the rotational diffusion uh, coefficient. The rotational diffusion coefficient gives rise to a time scale. This is a persistent time. This is essentially the time that your particle keeps its orientation before getting randomized. And since it goes with constant velocity, there's a length scale associated with it, which is the persistence length. This is essentially the length scale over which the paths of this um, active Brownian particle look straight. Ah, yeah. And here comes again an animation. So this is an animation of the active Brownian particle. And what you should see here is, again, so the, the trajectories look straight on small length scales, actually look straight on the length scale up to the persistent length. And I tried very hard to make this that you see that the particle moves at constant velocity, which is rather different from the active einstein uhlenbeck process that we had before. So this kind of moves with constant velocity and changes orientation. And if you come back to this picture, that we had before, so the random walk, the Brownian motion, this was this drunk sailor leaving the bar and doing random steps in any direction. What does this correspond to? This is drunk driving. Yeah? So this one is going with full speed and starts shaking with the wheel. Yeah? So this is much worse, don't do that, um, but that's the idea. Yeah? So this active Brownian particle is drunk driving, you go with full speed, constant speed, and then only the orientation. Um, so what is the difference between active Brownian particle and active einstein uhlenbeck process? Um, so um, I will show the, you the equations, but in the active einstein uhlenbeck process, the velocity was not fixed. Uh, so, the velocity, so the magnitude of the velocity was not fixed, and you see it immediately. So if you remember the propagator, that is the probability to make a displacement, this was just a Gaussian for all times, which is spreading. And I'll show you the propagator of an active Brownian particle. See, this looks rather different. So this is, looks like, so all particles start at the origin and they go at full speed. So you see there is a kind of a circle where the maximum probability is. They all go out at the, and you see this looks like, a, well, it looks like a hat maybe, or like a, um, so like in something like an, uh, an inverted Mexican hat. Yeah? So you see the highest probability is no longer as in the center as for the Gaussian case, but there is a rim emerging, and basically this rim goes out. If you wait long enough, this will approach a Gaussian again, but at least at short time, this looks very different from the active or, or einstein uhlenbeck yeah? So this is, uh, this is maybe, I think this illustration shows it quite drastically that this model is really, really different. Yeah? So the probability or not, the most likely position is not the same where you started it. Now, here comes the model. Yeah, here comes the model. So we have a stochastic differential equation for the orientation. So the orientation changes according to noise. So this is a noise correlation term, similar to what we had before. And here comes now the motion of the particle. So the position changes due to the following factors. We have a fixed velocity, and we move a fixed velocity along our instant orientation, and we may have some noise. So the instant orientation is parameterized here in polar coordinates, just with the angle that we had above. So this is the important term. So the motion is driven by this orientation that changes in time. And if you may add, if you want to, some noise. And I wrote, down, I wrote it down in the most general case. I mean, so these i and j are the Cartesian components. I wrote it for the case that you have unisotropic motion 
Uh, so what you need to do is you decompose your noise into a component parallel and perpendicular to the current axis. Um, and now you, uh, the first thing that you always should do as a theorist, you count the number of parameters uh, or the number of dimensionless parameters. So we have now this translational anisotropy, so the bias of going along the instant axis uh, relative to perpendicular to it, and we have the mean diffusion coefficient. By dimensional analysis, we can extract a length scale, a length scale of the parameters that I put in, this V and these uh, three diffusion coefficients. I put, uh, and the coefficients are chosen in such a way that suppose you have a passive particle in 3D, then this would just correspond to the radius of the particle. So here, my particles don't have any radius, and so this model doesn't talk about any radius of a particle, just it talks about the equations of motion, but I can extract a length scale um, A here. And using, uh, so, and then I can define the following dimensionless parameters. So one is the, uh, just the anisotropy, so relative dimensionless anisotropy, anisotropy relative to the mean, and the important parameter would be the Picklin number. So this is the velocity times this length scale to relative to the mean diffusion coefficient. So this is, again, a parameter for the activity of the particle of how far from equilibrium we really are, and this is the interesting parameter of the game. So, so since we are talking about fixed velocity in this model, yeah. Uh, the noise that we are having, is it the rotational noise? So you're, you're right. So the, fixed, so the fixed velocity corresponds only to this term here. And uh, then we add some noise. So, so technically, you're right. So if you refer to velocity to this one here, then the velocity is not fixed. It's only the, the velocity of the active contribution is fixed. Yeah? I'm not sure if I answered your question. Like... Uh, the velocity that is constant. This, uh, this V is constant. V is constant. And yeah. the eta that we are adding, that the, just uh, like adds in the rotational part of the particle? So, so it adds to the translational part. So this eta add to the trans. So this should be a vector. So it has two different Cartesian components. It adds to the vector and there's a noise term. This zeta here is a noise term for the orientation. And they are supposed to be independent. So eta uh, like sums up to rotational as well as trans translational noise, is it? Yeah, so, so this is rotational noise, this is translational noise. Okay, so then how are we saying that velocity is constant? I don't so know. only, the, so I corrected myself already, the velocity only of this active part. So this is the active part of the velocity, this is the passive part, and only the active part is constant. Okay, perfect. And Thank you're you. right, in the animation I showed you, there was no translational um, translational okay. noise. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, so remember this in mind, the Picklin number is the measure for driving, and we have the anisotropy. Okay. Now, start with an exercise uh, on, let's look only at the angular motion. Yeah? So, so that was a very simple Langevin equation, and we are looking at the propagator, so the conditional probability to find an orientation theta at lag time t, provided we started with an orientation theta zero. So that solves the diffusion equation. Ah, sorry, there's, there's the second derivative missing with respect to the theta. So there should be a second derivative with respect to theta. So that should be a diffusion equation. But we know the solution of the diffusion equation already. It's a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian. So they had this form here. But I corrected for the following fact. In, in my case, I, the angle is 2 pi periodic. So I don't really care. Um, so I, the orientation is just between 0 and pi. And there's an easy trick to repair that. Namely, I just take the sum with, um, uh, where the, uh, the phases of this theta is shifted by integer multiples of 2 pi. And you check immediately that this solves the diffusion equation. And so I corrected this error here. So that's the solution for the angular motion. Um, you can, uh, since it's a periodic function, you can uh, do a Fourier re representation and you arrive at the following result. You can also do this by separation of variables. Now, from this propagator, we can calculate certain correlation functions. So um, with uh, new and eta integer numbers, these are interesting correlation functions. What do these brackets mean? Well, 
brackets mean here, so this is the function that I want to average, theta and the initial value. So this is the probability to evolve from theta zero to theta in time t. And then we average over the initial value of theta, which is uniform, so it can be any value bet uh, between zero and two pi. That's why I have this normalizing factor here. And then I don't care about the final orientation, so I just integrate over all theta. So this is the definition of the correlation function. And using the solution here, or this solution here, you easily see that this correlation function decays exponentially, uh, uh, exponentially on the time scale of one over the rotational diffusion coefficient. And the higher these integer numbers is, this, um, this goes with this new squared. And it's also diagonal and new and mu. Uh, so only diagonal terms contribute. And with this, we can calculate, again, the uh, mean square displacement. So the increment that we are looking, this is the increment. I just in integrate my equation of motion. So this is the x component of the active propulsion. This is the associated noise. And of course, the same formula holds for the y component. Right? Now let's look at the mean square displacement. So I square each of these equations by copy pasting this. So I call this t prime and t double prime. And then you see I get cos cos. Uh, and I get terms from eta x, eta x. Here I get terms uh, sine, sine, and eta y, eta y. Yeah? And there's no cross-correlation terms because eta doesn't know anything about theta. So this is the result here. You use a trigonomic um, identity. This is the cosine of the relative angle. And here I can use my formulas. The cosine is just the real part of this equation that we calculated earlier. So I take the real part for nu equal mu equal one. So I get, the uh, I get this correlation function here. This is the case exponentially in time. And this is just the noise that I put in. And magically, if I take the sum of eta x and eta y, the anisotropy drops out. Uh, you get only the mean diffusion coefficient. So here is now, you can now easily do the integration and you get the mean square displacement in the following form. Um, with t rot as a characteristic time scale. And for long times, you can forget about this and you get effective diffusion. So there's effective diffusion at long times with, uh, with this enhanced diffusion coefficient. And if you look at this formula again, this is the same formula or it has the same structure as the einstein ullenberg particle or as the massive Langevin particle. Yeah? So you always get the same structural form. Um, um, you can, by this technique, in principle, you can calculate the higher moments, but it, it becomes more and more tedious. So it becomes really lengthy, and I don't show it. Um, uh, you can do it, but I don't show it. So, okay. So now let's look at the full propagator again. So, um, and I hope that you are familiar with the formulation of how to convert a stochastic differential equation in a Fokker-Planck equation. If you don't, then just believe me. So we want to have an equation for the conditional probability. So that is the probability to have a displacement r observing an angle theta in lag time t, provided you started with an initial angle theta zero. Yeah? So that's, that's all we want to know. And then there's a standard uh, technique to convert the stochastic differential equation into a Perrin equation or Fokker-Planck equation for this probability density that consists of the following terms. So this first term here is the orientational diffusion. That's the one that you should have seen on the slides before where I messed up the second derivative. Then we have active propulsion. So this is the active propulsion term. And then we have anisotropic diffusion. So essentially here are second derivatives uh, spatial derivatives of this p. It looks complicated because we have this anisotropic diffusion. And this equation is complicated because it couples the orientation u. So remember, this is just the unit vector cosine sine. Um, it couples the orientational motion to the translational motion. That makes it difficult. Um, but that's also the interesting part of the problem. So whenever you see such an equation here, it's, uh, you think of this is, the problem is translationally invariant, right? It doesn't really matter where we start our experiment. And whenever this happens, it's a good idea to do a Fourier transform. Yeah? So let's do a Fourier transform, a spatial Fourier transform. So this is a Fourier transform, I call this P tilde. 
And the result is that the P tilde uh, of the, um, um, fulfills an equation of motion where all these derivatives are replaced with I times K. So you see, you have I times K, and here you have just the scalar product U times K. And this equation here doesn't look that difficult anymore. I claim that this is reminiscent of a quantum problem that you may have discussed or not. This is just a pendulum. So if I cheat in a factor I H bar here, and this looks like a Schrödinger equation, provided this is the Hamiltonian operator. We have a second derivative. This looks like a kinetic energy, right? This looks like a kinetic energy, so that would be the kinetic energy of a pendulum, so what fixed length. Yeah, and what else would you have for a pendulum? Well, you have a, a potential that depends on the cosine of your, of your angle relative to gravity. And you see, here I have the scalar product of u and fixed direction k, that is essentially a cosine. Yeah? That's a cosine. And similar here, so here this gives a cosine. So why, how, how does this bring us to our goal? So what we want to do is we want to calculate the intermediate scattering function. So here's, the, again, the definition of the intermediate scattering function. And how would I calculate this from this quantity here? Well, okay, the Fourier transform we already did. So this is the factor that we want to average. And then we average over the initial angle, theta zero, that's why we have this factor two pi here, and we don't care about the final angle, so we just marginalize and indicate. So once we have this p twiddle, p tilde, then I can calculate the intermediate scattering function by performing this equation. And this is the goal now. Okay. How would you solve this equation for this p tilde? So um, first is I choose the direction of k in the x direction. It doesn't matter what direction you choose because it's isotropic. Yeah? So this is now the equation. k is in the x direction. And indeed, you have refined these cosine terms, as I promised before. You can do some trick identities to recast this in the following form. So we have a cosine term here and a cosine of 2 theta. Now, since I said this looks is reminiscent of a Schrodinger equation, you can also use the techniques that you have learned in quantum mechanics, because it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, you do uh, separation ansatz. So we say this p tilde is some time dependent times a function that depends only on the angle. The time dependence is exponential, it's kind of clear. If you put this in, you uh, uh, arrive at the following eigenvalue problem. So lambda is the eigenvalue of this eigen equation, and zeta of theta is the eigen function that we are seeking. Now, um, this equation is easy if there's no velocity if there, and if there's no anisotropy, then you can easily solve this. This is just a harmonic oscillator, right? So in this case, it's rather easy. Let's forget for the moment for the, uh, about the active propulsion, about the active propulsion, and we have this cosine two theta. Now you look up in the mathematical literature, there is an equation that is called Mathieu equation, which has essentially the same form as this one here. So this is the so-called Mathieu equation. And you can read this, so it has two parameters. A is the eigenvalue, and the annoying part is this, uh, this Q term here. So if Q is zero, this is easy, it's just a harmonic oscillator. And this Q is kind of a de deforming our oscillator, so that's why it's called deformation parameter. And you can read off how these are, uh, parameters are computed. Now, there's here a summary on the Mathieu functions. These Mathieu functions, that are these eigenfunctions, these are just deformations of cosine and sine. They are called CE and SE for reminiscence of cosine and sine. One is even and the other is odd. They have eigenvalues associated with this. These eigenvalues are sorted in a certain order. Um, um, here are some additional properties on the, uh, on the parity that I give. And one, without the deformation, you, of course, just recover cosine and sine. Yeah, and the eigenvalues are then rather trivial. In general, this A's will then depend on the Q. Okay. Um, what else is to be known? Okay, these functions are all 2 pi periodic, so they can be expanded in, uh, in, in cos, so you can do a Fourier expansion in cosine and sines, and by the symmetries, uh, this, uh, this uh, CE function involves only cosines here, for even index, they have only even cosines. For odd index, only odd ones. The sines have only sines, um, even ones, and odd ones. And similar to cosine and sine, these are 
orthonormalized functions. Yeah, so if you perform these integrals with cosine, so this here they yield a Kronecker delta, similar to and the sine similar here, and sine and cosine they are orthogonal. And what you can do, similar to cosine and cosine, you can expand any two pi periodic function now in these deformed cosines and sines. So these are the cosines, here are the sines, this is the cosine to zero order, and the Fourier coefficients are just given by integrating this one uh, times a uh, matrix. So this is all the same as you know from, I don't know, calculus one for Fourier uh, modes, except that I replace sine and cosine by these Mathieu functions. Now, once I know these eigenfunctions, I have directly my solution. Did I skip this slide? No. Um, I, I have had directly a solution for this P twiddle. So here arrive now the eigenfunctions, uh, uh, cosine and sine, and the time dependence is given in terms of these eigenvalues of this Mathieu equation. But we are not really interested in this P tilde, but we want to marginalize, so we integrate, over, so we average over the initial angle and marginalize over the final angle. And then this formula simplifies, so only the cosine terms survive, and this is some expansion coefficient. So this is basically the first expansion to see. This is this first expansion coefficient. So this is the formula for the intermediate scattering function expressed in terms of these values of the Mathieu function and the eigenvalues of the Mathieu function. Okay, um, there's one property that I like a lot about the solution of this equation, and uh, basically this holds for all passive systems. Maybe if you look at this, this is just a sum over relaxing exponentials with positive weights, right? So this is a function that decays monotonically in time, which is good. But here comes the thing. Not only this function decays monotonically, if I take a derivative, then you see I pull out a factor that is here negative. So the derivative or minus the derivative will again be positive and also decay monotonically. You see this? So if I take a derivative, this will also decay monotonically. And I can take as many derivatives as I like, this still will be a sum of relaxing exponentials and this should decay monotonically. These functions are known in the literature as completely monotone functions. So these are the most boring functions in the world. They just go down, and all derivatives also go down monotonically. And there's an interesting theorem that is not relevant for us, but it says that this also the reverse direction holds. So if you have a function that is a superposition of relaxing exponentials, here or continuous or not, then it's completely monotonic and the other way around. Okay. So, so far, we ignored any activity, but we had the anisotropic diffusion. So these are particles, this is an experiment in the group by Stefan Egelhaff in Düsseldorf, Germany. So these are kind of dimers, and these dimers are in the plane, so they diffuse, so here's some trajectory of these dimers. And this is the intermediate scattering function calculated both from, this calculated from our analytic theory, that is the sum over these relaxing exponentials, and um, the, the dots are the experimental results. And then you see, so the theory nicely explains the results. Um, this dotted, uh, these dotted lines, where are these dotted lines? These dotted lines are just single exponentials. So you see, the deviations from a single exponential are not very large, are not very large, so there are tiny differences to a single expo relaxing exponentials, but they are measurable. Yeah? So we can really see effects of the anisotropy, although the effects are small. So this delta is to zero, so this would be for an isotropic particle, the dashed lines, and you see for larger k, you see differences that are measured. Okay, so that was just a question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if uh, my memory serves right, so when we look at glassy systems, so there are two relaxation in the intermediate scattering function, mm -hmm. right? the beta and the alpha. Yeah. So what relaxation is this relaxation? Is it um, we are, so here we are talking about single particles. So I should mention, so this is a very dilute suspension. So in essence, these diamonds don't see each other. So this is very far from any glassy systems. But you are right, there are interesting dynamics for glassy systems. I have a long history on glassy systems, but I'm not going to talk about glasses at all. 
all exponential. I, I, I'm not able to see the function here because x axis in the logarithmic scale. This is a logarithmic scale in time, and this okay. is linear in the y axis. Right. So, and what functional form are the uh, intermediate scattering functions? So, this one here. So, this is a sum of relaxing exponentials I see. where essentially the first term dominates, but there's tiny corrections due to the higher modes. Huh? Okay. So, okay. essentially, it's an exponential, but there are small deviations. But okay. Keep this picture in mind because the picture that I'm going to show you, the active particle will look rather different. Okay, so let's go back now to the active Brownian particle. So this is the equation that we derived before. This is the self-propulsion. This is the anisotropy. We also had the eigenvalue problem. And now I'm doing the following. Now I ignore the anisotropy. So I drop out. Okay, here's R. This is that. This is theta should be here. Uh, theta and minus should be interchanged. Anyway, I drop this term here. And, well, this looks similar to a Mathieu equation. So this is the Mathieu equation. But now I need to do a change of variable because the Mathieu equation has cosine 2x. And here I have, I have cosine theta. So I just I make a change of variable to bring it in the form of the Mathieu equation. So forget about this term. Now, but now you see we have an imaginary deformation parameter. So our Q becomes now an imaginary number, and A is connected to the eigenvalues. And this will have consequences. So again, I can write down my solution of the Fokker Planck equation in terms of these eigenfunctions. So this is a long equation. So we see here this always theta over two. This was our change of variables. Since it's 2 pi periodic, only the even functions contribute. And we are really interested only in the intermediate scattering function. So again, we average over the initial theta, theta 0, and marginalize over the final one and get this result, which looks very similar to the result that we had before. This was derived by Christina Kurztaler when she was uh, still a PhD with me. Um, again, Let's look at the mean square displacement. So we calculated the mean square displacement by a pedestrian calculation before, but I want to bias you in this thing. This function can be read as the generating function of the moment. So we had this earlier. So it doesn't really depend on the magnitude. So I can average in the small k expansion directly yields r squared, the mean square displacement, and the higher moments. Um, and the result is the following formula that I showed you earlier. And it's plotted here. So let's start at infinite Piclet number. So at infinite Piclet number, it starts um, persistently. That is ballistic. It grows. So at infinite Piclet number, there's no translational diffusion. You just run. Right? You run until you change your direction. So it's clear that this increases linearly in time. So the mean square displacement grows quadratically. After the time scale t rot, you lose your orientation. Motion gets randomized. And the mean square displacement grows linearly. If you decrease the Piclet number, then you see initially, you see the translational, now we switch on the translational diffusion. So there is translational diffusion. At short time, this is linear. Then we still have this regime where the active propulsion kicks in. And at long times, again, it looks like diffusion. So we saw, we've seen this all before. OK. Um, you can calculate also. So I didn't tell, I'm, I'm not telling here, yeah, so I, I say, well, all you need to do is a small k expansion of our result. I don't tell you right now how I do this because this will be the content of tomorrow's lecture. Um, you can go beyond and calculate also the fourth moment and calculate this so called non Gaussian parameter that gives you the deviation from the Gaussian. And this is shown here. And you see now our propagator is no longer Gaussian which I showed you already in this animation where you have this rim that's spreading out. Yeah? Just, like, just like a stone that you throw in in the, in the lake, then you see there's a wave going out that slowly diffuses. So this is clearly non-Gaussian, and you can uh, compare it again to simulation. Now, let's look at the intermediate scattering function. And you have, I hope you have this picture in mind of, well, of, um, uh, of passive diffusion. So this is essentially, this is for small peak clean number, and you see again, this is a logarithmic time scale. They go down from one to zero, and you see these curves look very boring. They're almost exponentials, um, and nothing particular happens. If you go to high peak clean number, 
you see something new happens, you get oscillations. And this is something completely new. This looks very different from the dimers that we had, from the passive diffusion or, or anything else. Um, or, yeah, so you get these oscillations. If you decrease the Pecklin number, you still see some oscillations, but they kind of start fading out as you decrease the Pecklin number. Yeah? So there's this crossover to the passive phase. So these, these oscillations, these are the new feature of the active and now you should be puzzled, or maybe not. But how can that be? I think we look at the formula again. The formula had the same form as we had for, for the dimers. Essentially, it looks very similar to the dimers. And I tried to bias you. This formula says that this should be a completely monotone function. These are just relaxing exponentials. But now our deformation parameter is imaginary which makes our Schrödinger equation non-Hermitian, and also the eigenvalues don't have to be real. Yeah? So if all eigenvalues are real, then everything just decays monotonically and no oscillations can exist. So if you look at it, if you look at the, you can, if you look at the eigenvalues, so here's the real part and the imaginary part, then you see, depending on the wave number, uh, there are branches of eigenvalues that merge, and at the same time, a complex part pops out of, of nothing. Yeah? So it's the, the branching of the eigenvalues, the eigenvalue problem is no longer Hermitian. In this, you, of course, you get these in pairs, and this is how the oscillations emerge. This is the mathematical way to put it, how oscillations come into the game. There's another way that I wanted to show you here. If you look at this function here, this J0 looks essentially like a sign. Yeah? So it also displays oscillations. If you have very large Pecklin number, then all this delta R does is in, it increases linearly in time. So this is, looks essentially like a sign. And these dotted lines here are just this J0, K times D times T. And you see at large Pecklin number, this is a good fit. OK. Good yeah. question. Uh, so the oscillation, so is this because of the Bessel function, or is it because of the low k expansion? No, no, this is because of the Bessel function, yeah? So this is because of the Bessel function. Yeah? So the mean square displacement that I showed you here, this does not oscillate, so this just increases linear. And this is a feature that you see only at certain k values, and these, the k values that you have to look in are precisely correspond to the persistent length, yeah? So you have to look at the process right at the interesting length scale, and this is the persistent length. Yeah? So you look at length scales where your particle still goes straight. If you look at much larger length scale, that is a smaller case, then it looks random again. Yeah? So here, so this one here for small k, this decreases monotonically, and this looks rather boring. This looks similar to this one. Yeah? So in large length scale, everything is boring. On small length scales, you see persistent motion, if the pick lift number is finite, then also, the, like this one here, then also if you look at two small uh, scales, then it's also not interesting because the translational diffusion dominates. So the interesting regime is right, the one here, where the persistent motion kicks in. Yeah? That's where you see uh, the interesting. Okay. Uh, there's, an, there's another story here um, that I like to tell, namely, um, a colleague of mine tried to um, solve also the problem by doing a systematic cumulant expansion. Yeah? So, it, okay, let's try to calculate corrections to a Gaussian. So he solves something like 100 coupled differential equations, and he thought, uh, uh, and he said, so cumulant expansion essentially means an expansion of small k. Yeah? So you start with small k and you go with arbitrary out. And he said this worked quite nicely but he could never see oscillations. And the reason you see here is, well, you're making a perturbative approach from starting from small k, and you can climb up this branch here. But once you hit the first branching point, you're lost. Yeah? There's no way that in any perturbative scheme you can get beyond the branching point. So no oscillations whatsoever. Okay, so there's no perturbation theory, and this, this Complex argument, this is really a fingerprint of the active. Now let's um, come to the experiment. Uh, 
I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, but I still don't understand what uh, what does the oscillation mean physically. Um. I sh um. So physically mean so um this function so maybe I use the blackboard this function looks somewhat okay. So I think it looks somewhat like this. So every time, every time your particle is in this regime, you get a, a positive contribution, and every time you're here, you get a negative contribution. So in first, if, you're, so if your particle moves truly ballistically, or truly persistently, then it just increases linearly in time. Yeah? And this would be then deterministic. Yeah? So then in this case, the intermediate scattering function would just be k v k v t. No? And then you see as time progresses, you go from positive to negative, positive to negative. No? So it's kind of by the technique of the scattering, uh, by the scattering, is, uh, yeah, or, or another way to put it is the scattering technique kind of puts a pattern on it. So we, we have this complex exponential. A times delta R C, and then average. So if your particle just moves along this direction, you get plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. Yeah? Of course, you have to average over all directions. So if it goes this one, you get a also a thing, but it's kind of phase shifted. The net is then to do uh, this after averaging over all directions. Yeah? So because by this complex exponential, you kind of infringe a pattern which says plus, minus, plus, minus, so you have a standing range. Huh? Mm -hmm. In, in uh, When we did the Schrodinger equation, quantum mechanics, the, it was a Hermitian, like, uh, and that implied that the distribution function evolved unitarily. So does this uh, becoming a non-Hermitian problem creates anything for that uh, distribution function? Um, so I didn't really get the question. So I understood uh, it's, so what we I have understand. is a non-Hermitian pro uh, problem. And of course, there we are not on really mathematical solid ground, but as a physicist, we usually don't care. Yeah? So we just put it on a computer. Computer spits out complex eigenvalues, and we can we pretend that the completeness relation still holds. You can convince yourself numerically that they are still orthogonal and so on. But this doesn't really answer your question because I missed that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was trying to understand like this, uh, the differential equation becoming non-Hermitian, but it's a differential equation on the probability distribution function. Ah. So does it? Okay. So, uh, okay, you are worried. Can, can the probability distribution function become complex or something like that? Um, no, because the complex eigenvalues always come in pairs. Yeah. So once you have here, this branching, you get for each uh, eigenvalue, you get uh, the complex conjugate uh, for free. Yeah? And by, then you always combine this. So rather than doing this in complex, uh, uh, like, uh, complex uh, uh, functions, I can uh, split them in cosine and sine if you want. Yeah? And only the cosine terms. Yeah? So here nothing happens. So this intermediate and scattering function remains real. Propagator remains real. And this is good because I can measure it and I cannot measure imaginary numbers. But that's an important point. Okay. Um, so I think I'm over with my time, but I still would like to show you the experiment if I'm allowed to. Yeah. Okay. So this is the experiment. So um, there are, as I told you, you can do, you, you can do a scattering experiment, light scattering experiment, but there's a really nice technique that I want to introduce to you. This is just dynamic differential microscopy. So this is a 2D technique where, um, where you take subsequent images, you have the subsequent images here. And the first thing that you do is you take differences of subsequent images in time. This is a smart idea because sometimes you have dust in your sample that doesn't move. And if you take differences, this dust will just drop out. Then you take a Fourier transform, a spatial Fourier transform, and then you correlate with this. And then you can show, it's not so difficult, but I don't have time, that this measured signal is connected to the intermediate scattering function. Uh, this A of Q has to do something with the scattering properties of the single particle. This B is the camera. So 
this is a very nice technique where you can directly measure this intermediate scattering function uh, just by advanced imaging. Uh, so, and in comparison to video microscopy, it has the advantage that you get a high throughput. Yeah, so so you don't have, you're not watching a single particle, but you can do this with mil millions of particles at the same time. Now we contacted uh, a, a group in, in Edinburgh, so um, Aidan Brown and Wilson Poon, and they already synthesized um, particles. Um, uh, these particles are Janus particles, uh, and they have uh, the property that they somehow swim to the top glass plate. And once they reach the glass plate, they basically undergo some motion close to this glass plate. And what they already did is they measured the mean square displacement and fitted it to the formula that I showed you several times already uh, and determined this, what they call the motility parameter, the rotational diffusion coefficient, swimming velocity, and uh, road, uh, translational diffusion. And then Christina, when she was still a PhD, um, asked them for their data. I said, give me your raw data. I calculate intermediate scattering function from them. And this is the first result without anything. Yeah? And I think already this very first rank is pretty amazing because you see the oscillations. Yeah? You see these oscillations that we talked about. This is clearly non-Gaussian. And um, so the agreement is already rather good. So look at the time scales. We are covering something like two orders of magnitude in time. And in space, it's almost a factor of 100 of spatial resolution. So we are collecting spatial temporal resolution. But then she said, maybe I can do better. I can uh, I adjust now the parameters. I don't use their parameters. I use different parameters. And she achieved that fit here. It's like, hmm, the parameters have been determined before. So you have to make a check and look at the, like, at the mean square displacement. And you see basically the uh, experimental, um, the, um, the MSD that was fitted by the experimental list and the one that by Christina, they are indistinguishable on that scale. So although the parameter differed quite a lot, at least this rotational diffusion coefficient, you don't see a difference in this mean square displacement. Um, so I showed this image to Uk Shakti, who will, you will meet, I think, at the end of next week. And he said, ah, if you look really closely, you can see some differences. OK, I don't see any differences here. But this just tells you that the mean square displacement is not a good indicator, because it looks the same, basically, for all kinds of motion, einstein ulenbeck particle, uh, active Brownian particle, and also the same for run and tumble particles. It always looks the same, and it's not even sensitive on the parameter. But this is, uh, this is here on these oscillations. Okay, but so then we gave it back to the experiment and said, wait, 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 wait. this was just very preliminary, let's do better. Huh? So what they did is, uh, so these are now data from single particle tracking, which are very nice, I, I should have told you this. And this is the final result. And you see there's really nice agreement over, again, almost three orders of magnitude in time and two orders of magnitude in, in space. And to be honest, I've never seen such an, uh, an agreement in any um, uh, uh, biological or soft matter experiment except, say, for a single color. Yeah, so this is, I think this is truly amazing. If you do it with dynamic differential microscopy, this is the result here. This agreement is still uh, very nice, but you have to account for several things here, namely not all particles are identical. So the swimming speed is not the same for all particles. So I have to post average over the distribution of the particles to account for that. Uh, but the distribution is known, and you still get this nice agreement. OK. Um, so why is this model so good? Yeah? So why is this model so good? So this ABP, this is the good model for artificial particles. And all we added was one mesoscopic new time scale, this rotational diffusion time scale. And this is natural in the problem because um, the orientation is a slow variable anyway. You have this mesoscopic persistence length that comes with it, and that's the only length. Um, there has been a debate over many other things. Um, could you? Why shouldn't you consider velocity fluctuation, that the magnitude of the velocity fluctuation? Yes, this is true, but not on the scale that we are interested in. Same, does the particle stay always the same distance on the glass plate? No, of course not. It fluctuates, but much faster than the time scales we are interested in. Isn't, isn't there something like local heating by dissipation? Yes, there is, but the solvent quickly gets away of any thermal gradient. 
What about depletion of fuel? Yeah, you can see this. So you run out of fuel, but this takes much longer than the experiment we are talking about. And the claim is that this active Brownian particle model, this is the correct coarse-grained model on the time scales and length scales that you can see in the experiments. There's one more feature that's missing, that is the angular drift. So I told you we have basically the drunk driver, but there's no reason why the drunk driver should go on average straight. It could be that he's a little bit left-handed and was thick, and this will lead to a circular motion, which I will show you tomorrow. Okay, since I'm already over time, okay, this I show you, this I show you. Um, there's a neat mathematical analogy. So, um, namely that the trajectories of our active Brownian particles, they look like the configurations of semi-flexible polymers. It's an image of semi-flexible polymers, so you see they have a certain length scale, again, a persistence length. This is the length on which these polymers look straight. That's why they're called semi-flexible. And um, in a statistical mechanics description would be that. So you have a space curve, so S is the arc length, and then you would attribute a Hamiltonian to each configuration of your polymer. This consists of a bending force. You, so this polymer doesn't want to be bent. Yeah? Doesn't want to be bent. And maybe there's a stretching force, so if you pin it and uh, try to pull it apart. Yeah? So how would you do the statistical physics on that? Well, you should do a partition sum. A partition sum is a sum over exponential of these Boltzmann factors. But here we have a continuum of curves, so we need to do a path integral with this exponential. OK, fair enough. How do you do path integrals? Well, Feynman told us. Path integrals are a neat tool to solve Schrödinger equations. So let's ask, what is the Schrödinger equation to this path integral? And this is this equation here. And this is, is, this is precisely the equation that I showed you before. So there's a mathematical analogy between the two. OK, so I skipped the run and tumble model and come to the resume, showed you the intermediate scattering function for active Brownian particles. I showed you how we can use the techniques of the quantum rotor. And the new feature was really this characteristic oscillations that you nicely see in the experiments. Unfortunately, I skipped the part of the run and tumble particles, so I have to decide if I do it tomorrow or we just skip it. Yeah. Is there any further questions? In the scaling of MST plot of the active Brownian particle, where you go from t squared to t, uh, the crossover, the, is the characteristic crossover happens at inverse of t rho? Yeah, here. Yeah, so you so see it happens kind of here. At yeah. 10 to the power zero, OK. So okay. at t, about t rho, uh -huh. you get the crossover from um, directed persistent motion to random diffusion. Okay. Yeah? And that's, that's why this is the correct I mentioned this. Uh, this is the correct time, so I would did it in a smart way. Right. And in the colored noise model, you had this single, uh, sorry, it's like way behind somewhere. I didn't yeah. interrupt. It is the same image. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I chose the parameter in the same smart way that this should essentially happen yeah, sure, at sure, this sure. time yeah. scale. Right, tall. Right. But this time is now the correlation time of the noise. Right, huh? right. So there was a single correlation time. If you mm. want to have a spread of correlation time, then what would you do? Um, or for the model, you can. I mean, yeah. you can expand the model. Yeah. And do, there are several things that you can do. So you either replace this one by a sum of exponentials right. and put in whatever you like. Right. Yeah, you can do this at the price of adding more and more and more parameters, mm -hmm. which is bad. Don't do that. Um, or the other way would uh, this mathematically equivalent. You can add. Uh, under colored noise eta b with another exponential. So you can add many of these types and get basically any correlation function of the noise that you are not any, but a broad okay. class. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, maybe because of the interest of time, uh, we can take the discussion outside. There is coffee outside. Uh, the next session starts at 11.30. And also because there is a wide uh, variety of students here. So we have kept a one hour discussion session after the lunch. So at that time, please find the speakers. And if you have any doubts, you can 
come and ask them informally about any questions that you may have. Okay, so for now, let's just go out for the coffee and come back at 11.30. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.